Good morning, Seymour Christian Church. Hey, before we go one step further, can we show our appreciation for the praise band this morning and what they've done? And also for Brother Paul and for those who sit in the back that make all this possible, can we show them we appreciate them? We are continuing today our Summer in the Psalms. Summer in the Psalms. And as you know, the Psalms uh, are the hymn book of Israel. And for thousands of years, these have been the songs that uh, the Jewish people have sung. So just like we have a hymn book that has many different types of songs in it, they have the same. As you look through the Psalms, you'll find... whether from the north, south, east, or west, you were going up to Jerusalem because it's built on a mountain. And those are the songs they would sing as they would go to the temple to worship. They had songs that encouraged them to be faithful. And they had songs about their love and their faithfulness to their God. And today we're going to study one of my favorites, probably my favorite psalm of the 150 that are there. Now, if I was to ask a crowd, let's say a crowd of a, almost 200, if I was to ask a crowd that size, what do you think is the most famous or the most popular of all 150 psalms? Which one do you think you would say? 23. Psalm what? 23. Psalm 23, exactly right. And we know it because of its first verse. Its first verse is, the Lord, say it with me, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall. it gives me hope and within it I think David and Jesus are showing me how to live how to love and even how to die and even in the midst of suffering and pain that I can still praise the Lord I want us to look at the first verse if we could please Psalm 22 verse 1 my God my God why have you forsaken me now, is it just me, or does this one seem familiar? I could swear I've heard this somewhere before. Where's, where's this from? Oh, that's right. Jesus said it from the cross. Uh, who knows? Here's for my A students in the class. How many things do we know Jesus said while spending the three hours on the cross? Okay, we know of seven. And actually, I'm going to ask you, if you would please, to look in your bulletins. Hopefully you have one. If not, steal your neighbors before they notice it. And inside, you'll find, written there, the seven sayings that are recorded from us, or to us, by the gospel authors. You know that uh, everyone is recorded once, except the one we're going to talk about today. But something I notice when I look at those, they're all very short, aren't they? Jesus didn't preach a sermon from the cross. Why do you think they're all very short, simple sentences? Exactly. How did Jesus die? We know that before he's hung on a cross for about 24 hours, he is nonstop tortured. He is beaten. He's made fun of. He's run at times to Herod, at other times to Pilate, and then back to the high priest. We know in between he's getting beatings. They're not feeding him. They keep him up all night in, in an unsleepable prison cell. And by the time he finally gets to carry his cross, he can't even carry it. Remember, he fell on the way up, up Golgotha after he had been beaten within an inch of his life. And a man named Simon the Cyrene had to finish carrying the cross for him. He finally gets to the cross and they nail him there and it takes three hours for him to finally die. And while he's up there, 
You'll notice the first four things that he talks about are things that he can see with his eyes that he wants somebody to deal with. The first one, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. He's looking at the Romans. He's looking at the Jewish leaders. He's looking at those who are overseeing his death and saying, Father, they think they're doing a good thing. They don't realize what a horrible thing they're doing. So please forgive them. The second thing he mentions is, Verily I say to thee, this is to one of the two thieves on the cross, the one person who has spoken up that day in his defense. And he says to that thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. He looks down at his mother, who is there with a couple of friends of hers, plus his best friend John. And he says, Woman, behold thy son, and John, behold your mother. In other words, saying, I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm not going to be able to take care of mom the way that a son usually takes care of an elderly mother. John, it's your job. And, and Mary led her. And then he says, I thirst. He's thinking about himself and his body. The last two things he says are his way of saying goodbye. The first one, it is finished, is recorded for us in the book of John. That's also echoed in the book of John, I'm sorry, in the book of Revelation chapter 20. When we're told at the end of all things, he's going to say it is done. It's finished. Those words also were echoed by the priests at the Passover. Remember, Jesus is killed in the Passover, the greatest day of the Passover. And that is, was said by the high priest when the final sacrifice was offered for the sin of the people. It is finished. And then Luke records for us that, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But once, only once, in that three hours of dying from the cross does Jesus quote scripture. Only once. And who knows what verse Jesus quotes from the Old Testament while hanging on the cross. Who knows that verse? What is it? <laughs> exactly. We just read it. Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm going to work with the theory. There's a reason we started out in Psalm 22 and then took a deep dive into the New Testament because I have a theory and I want to lay this theory out to you and see what you think about it today I think Jesus from the cross because none of these things does he say does he go on and on and on I mean he's dying he's suffocating to death we're probably lucky that he was able to get out seven very short sentences but I think what he's saying is guys read Psalm 22 I can't quote all 31 verses but I can give you the first one and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think he's telling us you're going to find some jewels and some treasures, something that's going to help you in your walk with me if you would just study this chapter. And so that's what we're going to do here as we go through today. Before we go one inch further, let's take a moment and let's pray to the Father that he would guide us on our journey. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to open up your book. Father, I thank you so much for the life of David. Thank you so much for the life of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us and guides us and directs us. And we just pray today you would guide our minds, guide our hearts as we open up this amazing book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, two important things that I think we need to learn from Psalm 22. And the first one is this, that he knows what we're going through. God knows what we're going through. I think you're going to see as we walk through this that Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him on the cross before he went to the cross and he went there anyway because he knew God understood and God would be with him. The second thing I want us to look for and to discover is that in life's most difficult moments, we can go from suffering to praise. So let's look at that first point. He knows what we're going through. God knows what we're going through. Psalm 22, among many other things, is a prophetic psalm. There aren't many, but there are a few that tell of prophecy. A couple things I want to mention before we start looking at any further is the Psalm 22, was, if you look at the very first thing that's underneath where it says Psalm 22 in your Bible, it says written by David. David is the most prolific writer of the Psalms, nearly wrote half. He wrote 73 of the 150, so almost half are written by David, but not all. Um, David writes this at a time in his life when he is going through great suffering and great pain, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
But I wanted you to know now, he writes this over a thousand years before Jesus is even born. That'd be like going... a thousand years before Jesus, 700 years before, and the Romans were the inventors of crucifixion. So he invents this long before crucifixion is even founded. And let's jump into it and let's read together, beginning in verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 22. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he takes pleasure in him. David is talking about a time where he would see Jesus being mocked. Was Jesus mocked in his final 24 hours? Yeah, it was almost nonstop, wasn't it? Remember when he was first arrested, he was taken in and asked, are you the king of the Jews? And when he stayed silent, they played this little game where they covered his eyes and then they would smack him in the face and say, well, if you're a prophet, then tell us which one hit you. Um, Later on, when he's hanging from the cross, you'll remember that um, someone in the crowd said, hey, he saved others. Let him save himself. That's exactly what their verse 8 is saying would be said about him. We know he was spat upon. And on the day of his crucifixion, they made a scarlet robe and had him wear it. They even put a sign above his head, here's the king of the Jews, as if this beaten, destroyed, horrible-looking sight nailed to a cross could be the king of anything. They even made a crown. What did they make the crown out of? Thorns. So it wouldn't be beautiful. It wouldn't be showing his nobility. It would be showing his blood. Let's go on. Verse 14. It says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. What did Jesus die from? He died from two things. He suffocated and he died from an exploding heart. We know this because when they took a spear and, and jabbed it up, remember they wanted him to be, di- to be dead? And we know the spear went up from under the rib cage because it says in the Bible, not a single bone of his body was broken. So they got a spear to his heart without breaking a bone. And when they pulled it out, what flowed? Blood and water. The only way that happens is if the heart explodes and if you've been dead a little while. Like he didn't just die. He'd been dead for a while because the water had started to separate um, coagulation, I guess, from, from the blood. And the blood and water, proof that his heart was gone. And what does David say in verse 15? I'm sorry, 14. My, I'm poured out. My heart is like wax melting within me. Let's go on, and then we'll make something of all this. Verse 15 of Psalm 22 My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. What's another thing Jesus says from the cross? He says, I thirst. I'm thirsty. He says, I am out of strength. We know, as we said before, he couldn't finish carrying the cross up to Mount Calvary. Verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, as far as we know from the biblical record, was David ever pierced in his hands? Was David ever pierced in his feet? Now, who's he writing about? It's prophetic. A thousand years before they drove a nail into our Savior, David said, this is what will happen. As I said, it would have sounded crazy, just like when Noah said there's going to be a flood and the people thought, man, this guy's crazy. When he said that the hands and feet would be pierced, they would have said, he's crazy. Crucifixion had not been invented. What are you talking about, David? And verse 18, they divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. What did uh, Jesus see as he's hanging from the cross? As far as I know of the recounts of human history, this has happened once. I've never heard of a story of a person who's slowly dying, watching people gamble with dice for their clothes. And David said it would happen 
And what does Jesus see? It's happening. So what do you think of my theory? Am I, am I onto something? I can't take full credit for it. The theory's been around for a few millennia. And, but I think he's saying, re, get familiar with Psalm 22. It's describing exactly how I feel. And that main point is, God knows what we're going through. Jesus would have known Psalm 22 long before he climbed up on that cross. He would have known how they were going to gamble for his clothing, how they would spit on him and make fun of him, how they would wound him and how they would beat him and how they would drive nails into his hands and to his feet. And he did it anyway. Why? Because he knows. He knows God's plan is what's best for our lives. He understands what we're going through. Any pain that we might have, any suffering that we might hold, he understands. He knows, and he knows the answer. You know, God would have known the problem you're going through today before you were even born. God was ready. He has a plan. He's not up in heaven right now wringing his hands thinking, oh boy, I sure don't know what to do with this world. Oh, I sure don't know what to do. I wish I'd been better prepared for this. No, he knows exactly what's gonna happen. And he has a plan. That's the whole point of biblical prophecy. He, he tells us what's going to happen in the future so that when it happens, it strengthens our faith. Because we as humans are weak, are we not? Yeah. We are prone to wander, prone to stray, prone to doubt and fear. And he knows this. And he gives us these prophecies so that we can understand and we can be strengthened. And I want to talk about a second thing. So he knows what we're going through. And this, I think, is the main point of Psalm 22. That in life's most difficult moments, we must go from suffering to praise. Once again, in life's most difficult moments, we must go from suffering to praise to praise. I skipped a couple of verses because I was in such a hurry to tell you about my theory. So, um, the, and I want to look now at the couple of verses that we skipped. Verses two through five. Would you read this with me, please? He says, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. Notice David is crying out for help. He feels a deep loss. He feels pain. We feel pain. We feel loss. We suffer. Stephen's sermon two weeks ago from Psalm 13 mentioned how it's natural at times of loss and times of pain for us to suffer and to lament these changes that are against our will. God knows what we're going through. And David comes to the recognition. You'll see it there in verses three, four, and five. But God, even though I'm doubting, remember verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By verse two, he says, but God, I know you haven't forsaken me because you've always been there for me in my past. You've been there for my family in its past, and you've been there for my nation in its past. And Father, I know you're not gonna give up on me now. I think that is such the benefit of every Christian, every person in this room having a testimony, of having a testimony. Because what is your testimony? Your testimony is your story of your walk with God. And when you tell your testimony to someone, you are hearing through your own voice what God has done for you in your past. Knowing that he didn't forsake me then, he won't forsake me now. The God of yesterday is the God of today and he's the God of tomorrow. We know that God has been with our nation. We know he's been with our family. We know he's been with us. And even when we don't understand his decisions about today, we know he has what's best for us in his heart. I told you I'd tell you when David wrote this in his life. There's a 10 year period in David's life where he was in hiding. Now you're, you're asking why Dan? Pastor Dan, why was David in hiding? I will tell you why he was in hiding. 
he had been, you remember he's the young boy who was chosen to be king by God through the prophet Samuel. By this time, he had already killed a bear. He had already killed a lion being a shepherd for his father's sheep. Then later he kills the, the, the giant Goliath and becomes the general for King Saul. When King Saul finds out his son Jonathan will not be the next king, but this boy David, guess how Saul reacts? Yeah, he wants David dead. So he says to the army, okay, we're going to search the whole nation. You're going to bring David to me, and I'm going to kill him. He even has spies throughout the land. So David goes into hiding. But you ask, well, then why wouldn't David leave the country? Because what was David's job before he was hunted by Saul? He was a general of, of Saul's armies. And everywhere he went, north, south, and east, he had victory. The nations around Israel hated David because he never lost a battle with God's help. And they would have loved it if he would have come knock, knock, knocking on their door saying, hey, can I hang out with you guys for a little bit? So David is a man without a country. And he's feeling like Elijah. And many of these psalms that he writes of these 73 are psalms of sadness because he feels all alone. Many of them are rejoicing that there is a God who is listening to him and God is his only friend. And during this time, David is saying, these, the, then these verses that we read earlier follow. He's saying, here's how I feel, hiding in this cave. David's from Bethlehem, and the area around Bethlehem is full of caves. It's just caves, um, a cave maze. And David hid in there for about 10 years, feeling like he's wasting away, not getting the proper nutrition, not getting the proper exercise. And he says, God, why? But yet I'm going to trust I'm going to trust in you. Turn with me, if you would, please, to verse 22. And let's read together. I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will praise you in the congregation. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. All you descendants of Israel, revere him. For he has not despised or detested the torment of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. So it seems like to the casual reader, David is making a complete flip-flop here. That he's saying in the first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now he's saying, you haven't forsaken me. You've been with me every minute of the day. But he's taking us on a journey. I think he's saying, and this is so beautiful, he's saying, no matter what happens to me, I will praise you. I hear Jesus from the cross telling me, no matter what happens to me, Father God, I will praise you. And I hear Christians around the world today echoing these words, saying, no matter what the world, no matter what the pagans, no matter what anyone does to me, Lord, I will praise you. I thought when I was preparing this sermon this week of the song, Praise You in the Storm, and I want to read to you the first verse in the chorus of this great song by Casting Crowns. He says, I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen, and it's still raining. And as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain, I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side, and though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. Amen. Do we have a house today full of Christians who say, I don't care how hard the rains fall. I don't care how loud the thunder is and how bright the lightning is. I will praise you in the storm. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. In life's most difficult moments, we must go from suffering to praise. Matthew's sermon last week on Psalm 136 mentioned the phrase over and over, his love endures forever. 
When times are good, his love endures forever. When times are hard, his love endures forever. When the pathway is easy, his love endures forever. When the mountain is high, his love endures forever. Whether you're hanging on a cross or dealing with a loss, his love endures forever. And let's finish up this great text. Would you read with me together verses 25 and 26? I will give praise to the great, I'm sorry, I will give praise in the great congregation because of you. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear you. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Two things I want us to notice there. Notice he begins it by saying, in the great congregation, I will praise you. He's saying not only in my room or in my closet or in the privacy of my home. He's saying, even though I have been marked this terrible way, I will praise you where? In front of everybody. My praise of my God will not be held back. It will not be silent. It will not be private. And then he also says later in the next verse, those who seek the Lord will praise him. We're told if you seek for God, you will find him. And when you find him, you can't help but praise him. He takes you from suffering to praise. And you're eager to tell others of his goodness. You see, our testimony doesn't begin after we're through the storm. Our testimony begins while we're in the storm. What is God doing for you now? How is God providing and protecting and helping you make your way? Others need to hear your testimony. Don't keep it a secret. Don't take your light and hide it under a bushel as we sing with the children, but let it shine. I want to ask you one thing before we call it a day. I want to ask you if you would make, make Pastor Dan a promise. <laughs> if when you're going through the trials of life, the sufferings, the loss, the, the storms that you will suffer, would you promise that you won't leave God, that you won't leave his congregation of the saints, you won't leave his church? I have seen, I've been a pastor for about 35, 30, knocking on 36 years now. And I've seen so many times when people need God the most is when they leave him. And I don't understand it. I don't understand it. When people get caught in a sin or they have a loss that they, they don't, are not happy with, they don't understand God's choices. Or maybe something that was kept secret for many years has been made public. They leave when they need God the most. I think that's why we talk about sin so much in church. Because sin separates us from God. Now it's not that God leaves us. It's because we leave him. Remember the first sin? We're told in Genesis that every evening, in the cool of the evening, God would visit Adam and Eve. Can you imagine daily having a face-to-face -face chat with God? Except this one day. This one day God showed up and they weren't there. Why were they not there? That's right. They had eaten of the tree he told them not to eat of. Sin separates you from God. Are you guys going to sin the rest of your lives? Between, between now and your death or the return of Jesus, are you going to sin? Eh, probably. Some of you I can say yes for sure. No. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but in that sin, don't leave God when you need him and his children the most. When, if you knew there was a lion or a wolf outside and you were a sheep, would you leave the flock? No. I would stay where the flock is and I would stay where the shepherd is when I know the lion is near. So what's our bottom line from Psalm 22? I've tried to make clear. First of all, he knows. He knows what you're going through. He knew before you started going through it. And secondly, in life's difficult moments, we must go from suffering to praise. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father and our God, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you that you have saved us and that in our past, you gave people 
to us who would tell us of the goodness of God. And Father, we've tasted and we've seen that you are good. Father, we pray that you will help us as we go through the tough times of life. We know David had them. We know Jesus had them. We know we're going to have them. And Father, we just pray that you'll always find us faithful, always find us encouraging, always remembering what you've done and proclaiming to the world what a great God you are. Father, help us today as we go to our homes to bless our families, to bless our neighbors, to bless our friends. Father, help us to take this mercy and this grace, this peace of Jesus Christ with us. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen.